my name is John Asprey. Uh, I'm a senior organizer with Food and Water Watch, and I also serve as the chair of the Iowa Alliance for Responsible Agriculture. Um, I'm very excited to uh, be doing uh, this event in Iowa City uh, with the 100 Grannies for a Livable Future, uh, of which there are so many in the room. Do you all want to make some noise? <laughs> Um, but yeah, and you know, we have some great speakers, uh, both in person and on Zoom from a number of organizations. Everyone will get their own introduction. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just want to start off by saying, you know, I think we've all heard, uh, we all know how important agriculture is to Iowa's history and our economy. Um, but I think that there's a dominant narrative about how, you know, Iowa's agriculture came to be the way it is and whether that's a good or a bad thing. And so uh, one of the things we wanted to do is actually tell a more critical history. And uh, because that's a pretty big story, we wanted to bring folks uh, to tell different pieces of it from different angles um, to really, uh, really delve into how did uh, agriculture come to mean industrial agriculture and how uh, did uh, animal farming uh, come to mean, you know, confinements? So, um, you know, that story is a long is a long one, and it uh, starts. It could start in a lot of places, but I think the place where we wanted to start it off uh, was actually what agriculture looked like uh, before colonization uh, of of Iowa and and or the, the lands that are now Iowa, um, and so. Um, I could give an attempt to uh, set the stage for that, but instead I'd like to hand it over to Shelley Buffalo of the Great Plains Action Society uh, to talk a little bit about um, indigenous agriculture practices broadly, as well as uh, indigenous agriculture in Iowa. So Shelley, you want to come on up? Thank you, John. So I wish this thing stretched out more. Maybe I'll do this. So uh, my name is Shelley Buffalo. I am Meskwaki uh, from the Meskwaki Settlement in Tama, Iowa. I am 55 years old, and for um, 50 of those years, I have lived in Iowa, uh, mostly in rural Iowa. Um, so I grew up, you know, I, uh, you know, watching the farm crisis unfold, um, and especially. Um, the the loss of uh, our um, rural you know um, economies as a result of that, and we're still experiencing that. So basically, the farm crisis ha is still ongoing. But anyway, um, to specifically just give a little short history of in indigenous agriculture in um, the Americas. So um, maize which you know as corn, was domesticated uh, around 10,000 years ago. So um, in Mexico, um, southwest Mexico. And so that's, that was uh, the, you know, right around the end of the Ice Age. Um, and also, you know, right around that time, roughly, so was squash and beans. Um, and so these are... Uh, for indigenous folks of the Americas, you know, in the, I don't know if you describe it as the temperate region, right? You know, any of the regions that you can cultivate crops, that's like our primary um, foods, corn, beans, and squash. Um, for the Meskwaki people, um, maize came to us um, somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 years ago. And the Meskwaki are a northeastern woodland tribe or also Woodland Fringe. So um, roughly around the St. Lawrence River area is where we originated before we migrated through the Great Lakes into more of the upper Great West, um, primarily Wisconsin, um, a couple hundred years ago. So, um, you know, that's how long that we've been farming. Um, a perspective on how indigenous, you know, people farmed historically was, um, and I took this terminology from uh, Savannah Institute when they talk about perennial agriculturalists. So yes, we had our annual agriculture, but um, the way that we, um, the, the, our relationship 
with the land and with ecology um, was as perennial agriculturalists. So basically, sorry, I'm watching my timer here. Um, so, and, and in my opinion, we were the ultimate perennial agriculturalists. Um, we're, how we kept, well, we, we maintained grasslands and, and our primary tool was fire. And so fire has been used as an indigenous um, land management tool um, from east coast to west coast, north to south. Um, finally, folks in California are learning that that ecology needs fire. Like all of the huge forest fires they're experiencing, well, that's because they removed the original land managers from the land who um, had, had known that land and that ecology for thousands of years. This is like extensive, intricate knowledge of the ecologies. And so... Um, so that's what happens, right? The whole ecology is disrupted and thrown out of balance. But one example of this perennial agriculture is the bison herds. So, um, you know, like in the movie Dances with Wolves, um, it shows like, you know, the white savior, Kevin Costner, he's keeping a lookout for the bison, right? You know, and, um, and then he sees them, of course, you know, that's Hollywood for you. And that's also, you know, kind of the American mythology. Um, and then he goes and he alert, alerts the native, hey, there's bison, Tatanka, Tatanka. Uh, and, um, and that's like, it's not, uh, you know, that's uh, really incorrect. The, the, the large herbivores followed the people. And that's because the people created well, I mean, the, keep, the people manage the land in such a way to maintain grasslands, to maintain the prairie, as well as the oak savanna, um, keeping it open for large herbivores. Because I don't know if you know any of you have eaten squirrel or rabbit, but let me tell you, there's a lot more meat on an elk and a bison than there is on a squirrel and rabbit, right? So, um, so actually, these herds followed the humans. Um, there's a TED talk by Lila June, you know, that you can look up on YouTube if you want more information about that. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I just want to give you some numbers here. So indigenous people currently, um, of the world population, we make up 5%, yet we protect 80% of the Earth's biodiversity. Some more numbers here. Only 17% of global climate and conservation funding intended for indigenous and local communities actually goes to projects led by indigenous people. And for indigenous women, it's even less they receive roughly 5%. And as far as like the annual, well, I mean specifically the annual agriculturalists were predominantly the women. Um, I don't know if any of you have read um, Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. Um, I recommend that reading. Um, and uh, I think that like, what can you do to support um, indigenous people on the grassroots level, um, of course, there's a need for money. So I think that dismantling the the white savior nonprofit, you know, complex, is a good start to really look at that structure and look at how much money is actually going to the leaders in this community. The other thing is technical assistance, training um, people to invest in indigenous incubator farms, maker space. And then one of the things that I suggest is a BIPOC Bill of Rights, right? In order to, um, in order to uh, kind of ensure that there's good relationships between nonprofits and indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and by the way, there is some, uh, 
uh, literature in the back, um, a zine produced uh, by, at least in conjunction with Sakalis Nobis, also of Great Plains Action Society, if folks want to, you know, uh, read more about, you know, uh, Great Plains Action Society and sort of a, a indigenous perspectives on uh, agriculture. So thank you, Shelley. So I wanted to zoom to the uh, future or at least uh, forward a little bit um, because our next speaker is going to be talking about uh, how factory farms uh, came to be from the independent farming operations. So Shelley really clearly laid out, you know, what indigenous agriculture looked like and you know, as colonization uh, progressed uh, uh, through uh, the lens that we now call Iowa, um, there began and, you know, uh, more, uh, there began uh, animal agriculture of a different sort, you know. I think we all know the picture of the idyllic, you know, independent hog farm, independent cattle farm, and not just hog and cattle, like, individually, but, you know, farms where you saw people growing several different types of crops. Uh, we're talking about subsistence farming uh, of both crop and animal. Um, so uh, we saw a lot of people raising different types of animals, raising different crops. Um, but if you look around, that's not really where we see it, uh, at least not, a, not as much anymore. Um, I uh, am joined here by... Uh, Bond from the uh, Iowa City Public Library, who's going to be helping with some of the tech. Thankfully, it's not all on me. Um, but Did you turn uh, the projector off, or is it just muted? I think I just I turned it off. Uh, so for our next speaker to talk about the transition from uh, independent uh, agriculture to more and more factory farms, we have John Eichard uh, joining us from Fairfield. Okay, let, let me get started. I was asked to talk about sort of the history of factory farming. Well, most agricultural historians would trace the history of factory farming back to the 1920s. There was a lady on the Delmarva Peninsula at that time that accidentally got shipped 500 baby chicks instead of 50 chicks that she had ordered for a backyard flock. Uh, rather than complain about it, she just decided she was going to keep the birds and that she would confine them or put them in a building and feed them since she didn't have any space for them to you know, roam free and forage as they usually would do. So she it turned out it made she made a nice profit on that first flock, and so she continued to expand over time and ultimately was producing thousands of birds a year. Now, now her chicken buildings were much more like the backyard chicken coops that we see in backyard flocks today. But but this was the basic source of the of the idea that you could produce animals efficiently in buildings like factories. But it wasn't until the 1940s that poultry producers really began to produce. A, birds in confinement buildings similar to those that we see along the roads in Iowa today. Uh, following World War II, the widespread use of commercial fertilizers and pesticides uh, resulted in dramatic increases in feed grain production, and that led to lower feed grain prices, lower feed prices, and lower production costs in these confinement animal feeding operations as opposed to pasture operations. During the 1950s, then also we had the increased use of antibiotics to mitigate the, the health threats that are posed by crowding thousands of birds in factory-like buildings. And this also allowed the increase in the number and in the size of these chicken factories. During the 1960s and 70s, the US government made a major shift in farm policy. It supported a change in that time from supporting independent family farms, which it had done before, and it started supporting these large scale industrial agricultural operations. Now, the basic idea of that was to increase the productivity and the economic efficiency of agriculture by applying industrial ideas to farming. If many of you older people may recall the agricultural experts at that time were advising people to get big or get out. Uh, that was part of the industrialization of agriculture. But as the farms got bigger, they inevitably become fewer because we were increasing agricultural production much faster than the, the market or demand for food was expanding. So as a result of that, we saw thousands of farmers forced into bankruptcy during what's still called the farm financial crisis of the 1980s. We saw farmland prices drop by about a third during that time. This shift in farm policy also paved the way for industrial agricultural operations of all kinds, including crop production, as well as other species of livestock and poultry. 
While these large scale specialized industrial production operations are very economically efficient, they're also very risky. As we've seen during droughts and floods and trade wars, and most recently during the COVID pandemic, it's been we, the taxpayers, that have been bearing the economic risk of industrial agriculture. And we're doing it through government programs, including uh, direct payments to farmers, price supports, heavily subsidized production and revenue insurance. All of these support large scale and special uh, industrial kind of operations, specialized operations. By the mid 1970s, much of beef production in the country had already shifted from the farm feedlots to large confinement animal feeding operations. Uh, the, the beef animals still remained outside, but they were crowded into feedlots to make them easier to manage and to increase the feed efficiency. Beef breeding animals stayed out on the farms and ranches, but by the 1980s, most of the beef cattle in the U.S. were fed out in large factory-like feedlots. Hogs didn't begin to move into factory farms until the 1980s. Uh, improved sanitation practices on hog farms and routine feeding of antibiotic allowed the hog producers to manage the disease risk that had always been associated with trying to produce hogs in confinement. The industrialization of hog production actually began in North Carolina and it led to dramatic increases in hog production in the state. Now, hog production traditionally had been concentrated in the major feed grain producing states in the Midwest, and Iowa had historically been number one in hog production. But the economic efficiency of North Carolina's industrial hog operations more than offset the Midwest feed cost advantage. Now, factory farms didn't become a major public issue in, in Iowa, until the, until the mid 90s. Uh, industrialization had already shifted most of the cattle feeding to the Great Plains states because of favorable climate conditions, but there wasn't much Iowans could do about the, to, to change that. And the, the factory uh, poultry production had led to lower prices and increased consumption of poultry products and basically created a whole new poultry industry. But there was little hope for a similar expansion in, in the demand for pork or pork market to accommodate the expected and inevitable expansion in hog production as we moved into the capos. Many of Iowa's independent hog farmers were almost certain to be displaced if we brought in large scale factory farming operations for hogs. So Iowa continued to resist the expansion for factory farms until a large corporate hog farm moved into North Missouri. The, the Missouri operation included 80,000 breeding sows and a comparable size feed out operation, a feed mill, even a pork processing plant. Iowa's national leadership in production was challenged, not only by North Carolina, but by Missouri and other Midwestern states were almost certain to follow now. So the state of Iowa decided to extend a welcome to the factory farms. The, the hog pork industry has responded since by building thousands of large scale concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs, uh, along with hog slaughter and processing plants, facilities and feed mills to accommodate the expansion. Iowa succeeded in retaining its leadership in hog production, but it has lost more than 90% of its independent family hog farmers. Its, its farming communities are still struggling to survive as a result. Iowa's corn, soy, CAFO complex has, has created a water quality crisis and made the Iowa uh, agriculture a major contributor to pollution of streams and groundwaters into the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And the persistent air and water pollution from CAFOs continues to threaten the health and diminish the quality of life in rural areas, Iowans, to the, to the point where few people are willing to move into or even stay in Iowa's farming communities. Iowa succeeded in it maintaining its bragging rights as the leading hog producing state. But the people of Iowa are just beginning to understand the full rural economic, environmental and social impacts of the transition from diversified family farms to factory farms. Well, thank you so much, John, for sharing sharing uh, this history with us and for, for joining us tonight. Thank you.
Now, we're going to uh, take some time to talk about exactly how this expansion was helped uh, by uh, the powers that be in our state capital. But first, we wanted to take a moment to, you know, really go into the impact of factory farming on Iowa's communities, its environment, uh, and, you know, our, our health. And uh, for that, I'd like to bring up Diane delosier lar of the 100 Grannies to give that overview. Diane. Great to see all you here tonight. This is great. Um, John Eichert, I've heard him speak many times. He's fabulous, and he has all the history that you would ever want on factory farms. As John said, I'm Diane Delosier-Lar, an activist in Hunter Grannies for a Livable Future and also steering on the steering committee for IRA, which has got me here. Um, so I just wanted to start from the very top, from maybe 1997 to 2017. As John said, was it 90% of the smaller independent hog and swine uh, farms um, were kind of pushed out, and they lost lots of money in the, the economy and their local communities. When you had these large, large corporations coming in, you found that the rural communities slowly were losing their towns and the businesses that they had there. Um, the contract farmers didn't utilize, the factory farms, didn't utilize the local farming supply shops, the veterinarians, um, the packing houses in the same way that they had. Um, if you look at just a little side thing. Uh, on the DNR website, there are two maps, and one is of 2018 and one is of 2019, and it shows like dots all over the state where known factory farms are. Okay, that was 2019, so 2022, I haven't been able to get a map from them yet of what they think, how many factory farms are here, but it's, it's all over Iowa. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, not just the economy, but it's the waterways. And again, if you look on the DNR website, there, if you say impaired waterways, you'll see a map of all the rivers and streams that have been impaired. Um, and if you noticed in the news, a lot of the water systems, 200 at least or more in the state, have been uh, compromised, and they're trying to make them safer um, to provide clean drinking water. Uh, if and, uh, there is a documentary on Paramount Plus, it's called Wasteland, and it shows like what some of the things that happen where the factory farms are or the health of the, the neighbors around the factory farms. And Emma Schmidt is one of the um, the leading people person on the documentary and it was with I think CBS CBS yes I got that right so if you get a chance to do that watch that that's really really good um, so the runoff from the pollution is also impaired over a thousand miles of the rivers and streams so a lot of the runoff has gone into wells um, 10,000 wells in Iowa have been compromised and uh, continues to go to the dead zone. And we all know that in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, too often, we, have, we pour a lot of taxpayers' dollars into getting solutions for some of this, the pollution. And like an example, and I'm not exactly sure the whole logistics, but I just remember reading something about Lake Darling, that it was polluted and that they put some money into it, really did a lot of things to stop and clean up the water. And like it wasn't like a couple years later that it just went back to the beginning of being compromised. So we need to take it a step back further and further about um, we need to go to the source of where, where this is all coming from. And it's not just the water, it's the air, too. 
and the smell. A couple of things that really got me going with Factory Farms were I was at a cross-country meet with my granddaughter, and there's like hundreds of kids that were running, and um, all of a sudden I just smelled this horrible smell, and I thought, I knew where it was, where it was coming from, and I'm like looking around, where is this thing? It's got to be close because it's so bad. And I thought, here's all these kids out here breathing that air in, and the parents are breathing the air in, and nobody seems to be upset or concerned about it or really realize what the impl implications are of that. Of course, I was like, what do I do? So that's why I'm here, too. Um, there have been nights that, like in the summer, that I woke up, and I have to close my windows because it smelled so bad. And just recently, just like a couple weeks ago, I went out to the garage, and it was so bad. So I decided I went down to the recorder's office, and um, they have to, the confinements have to have a waste management plan for over, I think, 2,500 swine. Or, so I kind of plotted out around our area, Johnson County, Little Cedar County, and there was like 26 maybe factory farms. So I'm blaming those that are south of us for that smell. But anyway, I thought it was interesting. So how many more are there, other than just the ones that had to do a manure management uh, plan? So that's my other little story. Um, uh, it affects our climate as well. We know that. The DNR reports that agriculture is Iowa's number one cause of greenhouse gas emissions, and much of that is tied to the factory farming. So the DNR reported that. Um, uh, the health crisis of the factory farms between the air pollution, water pollution, climate impacts. Factory farms are making Iowans sicker. And again, I'm going to refer back to the wasteland from the Paramount Plus, um, that documentary. It's, there's like four sections, and one is Iowa. Are really, it, that's really good. So the pollution really affects the health. Um, can lead to blue baby syndrome, which a condition in infants that leads to bluish skin, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, seizures, in some cases, death. So this, these are just a few reasons why the American Public Health Association has called for a moratorium. And today, uh, today in the Gazette, there was an article, uh, opinion, or letter to the editor from Diane Rosenberg and Mike Schmidt that called on, the, the title was, DNR should address water pollution now. So that was a really good article. And Diane's going to be talking to us in a little bit, too. Um, let's see. It goes without saying when you have 2,500 hogs in a confinement that it's an unethical way to treat animals. Okay, I have one more story. Do I still have time? So, okay, I'm getting there. Okay. When I was uh, talking to a uh, man, I was in a quilt shop, and I was sewing some stuff, and a man came in with his wife, and he was a farmer. He sat down right beside me, and I'm like, oh, what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm a farmer. I have 14,000 swine over on my, my land. I have eight confinement things. And I'm like, oh, what? And it was just south, kind of southeast of Iowa City. And... I said, well, what do you do with all that manure? And he goes, well, I spread it out on my land. He's got maybe 2,000 acres. That's a lot of land. I go, well, what do you do in the winter? And he said, well, they come and just suck it out and take it somewhere else. I'm like, okay, where do they take it? Well, I don't know. So anyway, that made me realize that we've got a lot of things around Iowa City and Lone Tree. Coensville, Kelowna. So, anyway, I better stop now. <laughs> no, you did wonderfully, Diane. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Di Diane said it all, but between the water impacts, the air pollution, the climate impacts, the you know, effect it has on our economy. The list goes on as to why factory farms are, are harming Iowa. Um, and so, um, of course, uh, many of our, our state legislature, legislators and uh, the 
uh, corporations that back them have actually advanced uh, factory farms uh, through policy. And so I wanted to have, um, you know, uh, one of Food and Water Watch's uh, great legal minds join us. Uh, uh, his name is Tyler Lubdell. Tyler, are you on the Zoom? I am, John. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. And I can see you, and it's wonderful. So uh, before great. you start... Uh, Tyler's going to give an overview of uh, of uh, some of the ways that uh, our state and state legislators, as well as uh, our our courts, have made it easier and easier for factory farms to move into Iowa and expand, and harder and harder for harder for normal folks to fight them. So, with that, Tyler, you can take it away. Great. Thanks so much, John. Um, and thanks everybody for, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, even if it's virtual. Um, so yeah, as John said, I'm going to discuss uh, briefly restrictions on local control and also the legislative and judicial um, sort of hostility towards anyone in Iowa who dares to speak up against the factory farm industry or folks who might attempt to protect their rights and interests in the face of harm caused by factory farms. And so I'm going to do that by talking about three different buckets of things. The first is the master matrix. The second is what are called right to farm laws. And the third is what are called ag gag laws. And so I'll take those in turn. The master matrix, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with this because I understand uh, Dr. Secchi is going to discuss the master matrix as well. But in a nutshell, what the master matrix does is it takes away local control for fundamental land use decision making. In other words, where can a new factory farm or an expanding factory farm be located? And it's important to note that traditionally and, and almost universally, that type of a decision, land use planning, is a fundamentally local enterprise. So it's extremely rare for state or federal officials to usurp that local land use planning type decision making, but that's exactly what's happened here with the master matrix. And so the way the matrix works, um, uh, it, it's essentially, it's a matrix, right? It's a bunch of uh, criteria, which are then scored and those points are summed. And if the uh, proposed new or expanding factory farm meets the point threshold, it, it, it gets to move forward. And counties are able to adopt the master matrix or not. If they don't adopt the master matrix, they don't get any say in this, this, this process. If they do, then they get to run the initial assessment of those numbers. Um, but this is where sort of the, the one-way ratchet kicks in. If the county were to determine that the proposed new or expanding factory farm doesn't meet the point threshold, um, that isn't the end of the day, as it is if the county decides that they do meet the point threshold, then it, everything just moves forward. If they decide otherwise, it actually goes to the state DNR, who will rerun the numbers, will redo the assessment. And if DNR decides that the point threshold has been met, then the project goes forward despite opposition from the local level. Um, so it's very problematic in that, in that it's taking away those critical decision-making abilities from those most impacted by the siting of these facilities. And I'll note that Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement and Food and Water Watch submitted a petition for rulemaking in 2017 to DNR, calling on them to revise these regulations uh, with respect to the master matrix. And um, as you would imagine, industry uh, vigorously opposed that and, and DNR ultimately denied the petition. So moving on to right to farm laws. So, so what is right to farm legislation? Um, essentially, right to farm laws uh, strip uh, private citizens' ability to bring nuisance lawsuits against agricultural operations. And, you know, initially, right to farm laws were a reaction to uh, uh, urban sprawl, this concern that urbanites are moving into rural and agricultural areas, and there would be tension between those different demographic groups, farmers on one side and urbanites on the other. It has been most rigorously and problematically applied to factory farming. And that's typically where we see it um, being used today. And essentially, you know, going all the way back to our earliest legal history, you know, well before the United States of America was a country, some of the earliest cases in our legal jurisprudence have to do with this dynamic of one neighbor unreasonably behaving in a way that harms their, uh, their, their, their neighbor for one reason or another. So this is fundamentally embedded in our in our legal system that when I am harmed by by my neighbor I can go to the state and I can find relief I can have the state compel that bad actor to make me whole 
um, because that person has compromised my ability to enjoy the comfortable use of my property or my, my life. Right to farm laws eliminate that protection with respect to agricultural operations and most notably with respect to factory farming. And so essentially uh, uh, under Iowa law, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on this in a second with respect to a, a very recent Iowa Supreme Court decision, but under Iowa law, um, you are not a lot, you, you would have a very, very difficult time and frankly, an almost impossible time uh, uh, protecting your own comfortable use and enjoyment of your property in the face of factory farm pollution and public health impacts. And that's because the state of Iowa, your legislatures have decided that they value the profit margins and the factory farm industry more than they value your ability to protect your life and property and your, your quiet enjoyment of, of, of the same. And the reason why I say this has gotten a lot worse or, or, or the, the recent uh, court intervention here, um, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, we have an Iowa constitution, like I have rights under the constitution, how can the, state, how can the government do that? Um, and your Supreme Court initially recognized that tension and had adopted a three-part test in a case called Gacky, where an individual could overcome the right to farm law against a factory farm if they were to, if they were to satisfy these three elements. Okay. In other words, the court recognized that there is a fundamental constitutional right, sometimes called the inalienable rights clause, uh, Article 1, Section 1 of the Iowa Constitution, and that the right to farm law really infringes on that. Um, unfortunately, this summer, uh, the Iowa Supreme Court overruled that case in a case called Garrison. They eliminated the three part test and replaced it with what's called rational basis review which is legalese for extremely deferential to the state. And so the current situation in Iowa is that, as I said, any individual harmed by a factory farm acting unreasonably would have a very difficult to impossible time uh, succeeding on a claim to protect your rights and be made whole again under that doctrine, as I said, that goes back literally millennia. So, you know, the only other thing I'll mention about the Iowa Supreme Court is uh, Food and Water Watch and others had brought a novel lawsuit um, under what's called the public trust doctrine, um, essentially calling out that the state DNR and other state officials are trustees of the state's water resources. And our remedy, what we wanted is to compel the state to put in place a remedial plan for the Raccoon River uh, to stop the Raccoon River from being impaired by factory farms. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court dismissed that case on two grounds. One that we didn't have standing. In other words, they concluded that there wasn't, that we didn't have skin in the game as plaintiffs, but more importantly, they dismissed on what's called a non-justiciable political question, which is gobbledygook legalese, which means you need to vote. That is the court saying that this is too tricky. We don't wanna to touch this with a 10 foot pole. So we're leaving it to the political branches. We're leaving it to the governor and we're leaving it to the legislature. So that is the Iowa Supreme Court telling you as Iowans vote, because if you don't like this idea, that's where you're gonna solve it. And finally on ag gag laws. So what is an ag gag law? Ag gag laws are designed to silence unfavored viewpoints with respect to factory farming. And so the idea is to intimidate or dissuade environmental or animal activists from exposing what happens inside factory farms, right? Secrecy is a fundamental premise of factory farms operating in this country, because most people, if they knew what actually happened in these confinement facilities um, would be outraged, right? And so ensuring that the public doesn't know what a factory farm really looks like is, is central to the, frankly, the business model of factory farming. And Iowa has been on the forefront of ag-gag laws. Um, the Iowa legislature has passed four ag-gag laws at this point um, with nuances among them. But the important point is essentially each ag-gag law has been in response to federal courts striking down the previous one. So when the first ag-gag law was struck down by federal courts, the Iowa legislature pretty quickly passed the second one. When the second one was struck down, they passed the third one. When they realized the third one didn't really accomplish what the factory farm industry wanted, they passed the fourth one, which just a month or two ago got struck down again by federal court. Uh, both the second and fourth ag, -Ag laws are currently on appeal to the Eighth Circuit. And so this really is the legislature doing the bidding of a rapacious industry. Um, and it's important for you all to recognize that these are your taxpayer dollars being spent. 
So these are not simple cases. They take a lot of work. They take multiple attorneys at the Iowa AG's office um, and they take a lot of resources. And so, you know, these are attorneys employed by the state that could be protecting Iowans from fraud or any other number of ills. Instead, they are, you know, the lackeys of the factory farm industry and are out there passing blatantly unconstitutional laws uh, so that the factory farm industry doesn't have to worry about, you know, fundamental constitutional rights, people having a First Amendment right to expose how their food is produced, for example. So yeah, ag gag laws are really problematic. I'll leave it there. Um, thankfully, the courts have seen them for what they are, and that is a blatant violation of our free speech rights. I'll pass it back to John with that. Thank you, Tyler. Um, and I gave Tyler a terrible introduction before, but Tyler uh, is, again, a senior attorney with Food and Water Watch uh, on the board for uh, Crate Free USA, a coalition against extreme confinements, and is joining us all the way from Boise, Idaho. So thank you, Tyler, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, in the meantime, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, someone who I hold in, in marvelous esteem. Uh, is a, uh, a, she is a uh, professor at the University of Iowa um, and covering the gruesome truths of uh, our farm and environmental policy. And uh, in her spare time, uh, runs a podcast. Uh, uh, we all want clean water because, uh, you know, as every the industry claims, we all want clean water. And uh, that's actually uh, what we've brought her here today to talk about. So Dr. Sylvia Secchi, please come up and tell us about uh, how industry and politicians are really just trying to do right by us. Well, some of you know that I am just a co-host of the podcast, and the title of the podcast actually comes from one of Chris Jones' um, blogs, and Chris is one of my co-hosts, and it's very ironic because in Iowa where we uh, talk the talk, and most assuredly, we don't walk the walk. Um, and then our third co-host, uh, who's having his hands full with PFAS these days, is uh, Dave Shortney, um, also at the University of Iowa. So um, I thought I would start really giving a maybe 30-second um, reminder to everybody that white settler agriculture um, was extractive from the beginning. Uh, the plowing of the prairies, the destruction of the buffalo was a colonizer enterprise. Uh, the destruction of the wetlands, the straightening of the rivers, the disappearance of the passenger pigeons and uh, the rivers of birds that we had in Iowa in the 1850s. But this process that was a uh, very violent process in many, many ways, violent for people and violent for the land and the water, has accelerated. And so what we're talking about here with the uh, issue of confined animal feeding operations and this complete separation of animal agriculture from production agriculture is a process that um, has now reached a speed, right? It's, it's a snowballed, uh, and it's reached a speed that is uh, really dramatic. Uh, from the beginning, it, it's a process that was aided by uh, federally funded and state funded institutions, including my alma mater, Iowa State University, uh, which has produced research that has allowed the fallacy that these operations are more efficient to be uh, spread around. These operations are more efficient only if you don't count a lot of the costs, the social costs to rural communities and the environmental costs to us in Iowa all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, if we do magical accounting, which is what we are really good at doing in Iowa, it's efficient. You know, we do magical accounting with one of the main tools that we use, which is the nutrient reduction strategy. Because if you look at the nutrient reduction strategy and its um, progress reports, confined animal feeding operations, let alone uh, factory farms, are not mentioned once. We are only looking at the one side of the ledger where we are applying all these tech fixes like bioreactors and constructive wetlands and cover crops and no-till uh, to, um, uh, you know, we're, we're saying we're doing all these things and we're not considering that the number of hogs in Iowa between 1974 and 2017 has doubled. And the number of operations with hogs has gone from about 60,000 to 6,000. And then when you do the math, you realize that actually, you know, it's um, 
1,000 of these facilities are so big, they are responsible for most of the production. And same thing with um, layers. Iowa is the biggest producer of hogs. It's been the biggest producer of hogs in the U.S. since 1880, but now we produce a third of the hogs in this very small number of huge facilities. Well, we now are also the biggest producers of um, eggs. And it turns out that 29 operations produce about 15% of U.S. eggs in Iowa. Imagine what that means in terms of biosecurity and avian influenza and the kind of like animal welfare issues that you have when you have literally, uh, you know, floors of birds on top of each other, pooping on top of each other. Okay, so the, but it's efficient, my colleagues at Iowa State will say. So what we have, though, in the nutrient reduction strategy is no mention of these issues, but we count the meetings we have with farmers, and we count the number of wetlands that we um, have constructed, and we count the bioreactors. And we say things like, we have a 50% increase. I mean, yes, you know, if you go from two to three, that's a 50% increase. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, Sometimes, you know, the, the, the propaganda, as my um, daughter um, calls it, is, is a bit much. So what we have in Iowa is we have no consideration of the costs that these um, confined animal feeding operations impose on all of us. We have, as we just he heard from Tyler, it's no, it's no um, coincidence that we raised one-third of U.S of U.S. hogs. We raise one-third of U.S. hogs because we basically have no regulation. And so it's, you know, it's a race to the bottom kind of situation. We have all these corn and soybeans because we've created a federal policy that really favors the production of these crops and discourages the, the diversification of farms. And we have virtually no regulations. Uh, and so that's why we're attracting more and more of these uh, operations, and these operations are getting bigger. And our policy in response is either to deprive local communities, as Tyler was saying, of control, or to pretend that we're making progress by measuring pitiful um, amounts of conservation, which is really ancillary to production. When we had the ethanol boom, we stopped putting land in the conservation reserve program, for example, and increased the acres in production. So this is a situation that is um, made worse by the fact that it's bipartisan. Uh, I want to remind everybody in this room who doesn't know already that the CO2 pipeline, another one of these false solutions, which are going to perpetuate the use of a very inefficient and polluting source of energy, corn ethanol, uh, one of the pipeline employs both our former governor, Republican, and the son of another former governor, nor a Democrat. So uh, there is bipartisanship in imposing the costs of these operations and systems that benefit very few. Um, and that's uh, something that really needs to change. And the reason why I'm here is I'm not advocating for anything. I don't advocate. I testify, which is I'm testifying to you that things are bad and they can be different. This is not... This efficiency mantra is a lie, and we can do things differently in ways that promote social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seki. Uh, so uh, finally, instead of just being the transition between speakers, I'm actually going to talk for a minute. Um, so again, uh, my name is John Asprey, and I want to talk to you all a little bit about uh, policy, not bad policy. We've heard enough about bad policy. We're going to talk a little bit more about bad policy, but also some good policy. Um, so uh, first off, as, as Dr. Seki was talking about, we've seen a number of false solutions, whether it's the uh, voluntary nutrient reduction systems, 
uh, whether it is um, these, uh, the obviously the carbon pipelines uh, being planned for Iowa, and uh, you know whether it's biogas, the uh, plan to make uh, energy out of uh, hog and cattle poop, uh, and still leave behind the poop, uh, but you know concentrated and be able to make a buck off of it by selling the methane uh, from anaerobic digesters. Uh, on the energy market. So we got a really, we, you know, it seems like our government and industry have a really great plan to just, you know, keep finding, finding a new way to make a buck off of this crisis. Uh, but there are actually, you know, things we could do that would solve it. And I'd like to talk about some of them. Um, uh, for, first and foremost, the one nearest and dearest to my heart is, of course, passing a moratorium on factory farms. I think we all know it's time. Um, and we're not alone, right? Like 63% of Iowans agree that uh, we need a moratorium on factory farms. The problem is that uh, we're not as organized as, as big ag yet, and we need to get there. So uh, this is, you know, one of a number of, event, of events we're doing uh, across the state, you know, th this season. Uh, but this fight is a, a years long fight uh, to beat big ag. So we uh, need all the power we can get. Um, so a moratorium, uh, also, you know, it's worth saying that if we had meet local control that was worth anything at all, uh, it would definitely improve the situation because people in the, in their own communities could fight factory farms in a way that didn't eventually kick the can to the department of natural resources who will just decide to do whatever they want anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, I should also say, uh, at, at the federal level, there is an equivalent to the fact, factory farm moratorium. It's called the Farm System Reform Act, uh, sponsored by Cory Booker in the Senate. And it also puts a moratorium on factory farms and phases them out and creates money to fa help contract farmers phase out of factory farming and does a load of other good stuff. So if you haven't looked into that, strongly recommend uh, you know uh, finding out more about the Farm System Reform Act. Um, some other good policies, um, you know, obviously one of the reasons why we're in this mess is because, uh, a small number of massive corporations control our food system. And, uh, you know, there once was a time when occasionally our federal government would see that a corporation was getting too big and powerful and intervene. Uh, it was a long time ago. It was the 1900s, but there's this whole phase called the uh, the, the the trust busting, uh, the the you know the the trust busters, where they would actually say, "Hey, you're a monopoly. You can't do that anymore," and force companies to break up. Uh, so we need we need that for the uh, 21st century. And there is legislation, the Food and Agribusiness Merger Moratorium, that would pause mergers and acquisitions and review antitrust laws. Um, there's also this thing that's been around, again, since the early 1900s, called the Packers and Stockyards Act. And in true government fashion, um, industry got in the way of any of the rules ever being written to really enforce it. But they are trying, once again, to uh, actually bring some, some, some uh, fairness to the uh, ag market uh, with rules on the uh, tournament system, which is how they pay uh, a lot of uh, poultry farmers. Uh, competi fair competition rules so that, you know, uh, basically packing houses can't show preference between farmers. Um, so obviously we need to take a look at corporate power. Um, it goes without saying we need to fight against the expansion of biogas here in Iowa. Um, we've seen uh, biogas on the rise, mostly in North Carolina, to be honest. There's been some huge partnerships between the hog farms in North Carolina and uh, and specifically Smithfield and Duke Energy. So literally the big electricity and power company and uh, the big pork producer uh, are building a lot of infrastructure out there. And there's a reason to be concerned that something similar will happen here. Uh, just last year, uh, a law was passed to expand use of biogas digesters to turn uh, uh, essentially manure into methane gas. Uh, and so... We need to uh, we need to oppose any further attempts to expand biogas because uh, one should, goes without saying like methane still emits carbon like it's it's natural gas from poop but it's still natural gas um, but obviously it's going to entrench factory farms more if there's another source of profit on them 
Um, and all of this is really leading up to me saying uh, the farm bill is coming up in 2023. And there's a lot of aspects of the farm bill that address all of the issues I just talked about, um, whether it's, you know, commodity pricing, whether it's uh, support for, um, you know, price controls uh, on our ag sector. Right now, we have a problem where corporations have written the rules for decades uh, about what agriculture looks like. And there's an opportunity in the coming, you know, year and a half to intervene in that process because every six years the farm bill has to get uh, reassessed and reauthorized. So this is the time to really, you know, think about what a food and farm system we want to see looks like. You know, do we want these uh, giant packing houses do, or do we want more local supply chains? Do we want, you know, globalized agriculture or do we want, you know, independent producers around the corner? What kind of, you know, meat and do we want to be buying and putting in our bodies and what kind of agricultural systems do we want to be supporting, not just with our dollar at the supermarket, but with our tax dollars. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to get involved um, on a policy front because, you know, not only is the farm bill happening, but the legislative session starts in like three weeks. So there's going to be a lot uh, to do mostly around the moratorium. Um, so, that is a brief overview of uh, the legislative front. And uh, next, I want to pass it uh, to uh, my esteemed colleague, Diane Rosenberg, uh, to, uh, from Jefferson County Farmers and Neighbors, um, a true hero of the factory farm fighting movement, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the, the organizing outlook. Um, Diane, are you on Zoom? Please, Zion, are you on Zoom? Well, I'm going to unmute, but I'm not sure that's going to fix this problem. Uh, let's call it a two-minute intermission to grab snacks while I call Diane. Because she's been on the Zoom <laughs> since the beginning. Uh, to talk a little bit about... Uh, the, oh, the Diane, opener. there's a delay. Uh, Wonderful. You? Diane, no. can you hear us? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. There's Amazing. A delay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, Diane, if you want to um, turn the sound off on your computer, I'm though. Mute, but I'm not sure that's going to fix this problem. Diane, stop the live stream uh, because a there's a delay. Two minute intermission to grab the snacks while I call Diane. Because she's been on this. Uh, you know, to talk a bit about yeah, I'll give her a call. And there's a delay. There we go. Is that any better? Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I was watching on um, uh, the YouTube. Perfect. <laughs> I that. Yeah, no, we're I all set now. Feedback. In the old days, you had to turn your volume down on your radio when you called in, right? It's the same thing. <laughs> oh, amazing. Well, Diane, give us the organizing perspective. Uh, and uh, thank you again for joining us tonight all the way from Fairfield. Well, thank you so much, John. And thank you, everyone. This has been an excellent, an excellent meeting tonight. And I want to thank all the members of IRA for putting this together. Um, you've heard a lot tonight about how we got into this very regrettable and destructive predicament. But I'm gonna talk about how we can start to turn this around. And I do believe that's possible. It's not gonna happen overnight and it's not gonna happen without a lot of work and creativity. But the industry itself is ultimately not sustainable because it lacks resiliency. And turning it around involves people like you and me, organizing and taking steps large and small. The way I see it right now, all the work we're doing is building a strong foundation of change. It's really important work. Big egg and big food right now seem like a big monolith. It can seem overwhelming to challenge and sometimes it makes you think, is what I'm doing have any effect at all? But yeah, I'm here to tell you, yes, it is. Uh, and I'll tell you why. But first, going up against big ag and big food is in a lot of ways like what the abolitionist and suffragette movements faced. When they first started, they also were challenging deeply entrenched systems. But they kept at it, they kept organizing, they kept working to courageously confront terrible injustices they built awareness and motivated people to demand change and ultimately, and it took time,
but ultimately they prevailed. Big ag and big food is an equally important issue because it's ultimately an existential issue. If we can't get food and agriculture right, we're not gonna survive well as a species. So our efforts in laying this foundation is very important work. And even though the industry is quite powerful, when we put our energies together, <clears throat> excuse me, we are powerful too. Now I can say with absolute certainty that what we're doing is actually having a definite impact because over the last 15 years that I've worked on agricultural issues, on CAFO issues, I've seen noticeable changes and I find that very encouraging. In 2007, when I first started with JFAM, there was a certain level of awareness around the CAFO issue in the state, but I have to say it wasn't extensive and it seemed to be more in pockets. But now in 2022, it's very different. People across the state are fed up with CAFOs. They're fed up with polluted waterways. They're fed up with losing property values, breathing in putrid air, losing their quality of life, and they're fed up getting physically sick from CAFOs. As John mentioned, 63% of Iowans today want a factory farm moratorium. That wasn't even a serious consideration in 2007. In fact, we've had a factory farm moratorium bill in the state legislature for the past seven years, and each year it gets more co-sponsors. So yes, we have made progress, but we have more to go. And I'm gonna talk about how we can continue to build on that progress. First and foremost, we need to work on the community level. When CAFOs are proposed, we have to speak out and organize if we don't wanna live near a massive number of hogs. That means talking to neighbors, holding planning meetings, developing strategies, putting those strategies in action and not letting up. If a master matrix is involved, it means going to the scoring session, getting supervisors to hold a public hearing, getting a lot of people out to attend and making comments, build that public pressure. It's a given that state laws don't make it easy to stop CAFOs, but they can, they can and they can be, will be stopped when communities organize and put the pressure on and keep that pressure on. I've worked with neighborhood groups in Potawatomi, Tama, Howard, Washington, and Wayne counties that were successful. Factory farms have been stopped in Worth, Dallas, and other counties working with community groups, with Iowa CCI and other organizations. These successes usually center around strong and sustained community opposition. My experience is also when a community organizes against a CAFO, even if they can't stop that confinement, they're creating a deterrent effect that protects against additional development in that area. I've seen that a lot in Jefferson County. Now, you don't have to fight a factory farm alone. It's hard work. Reach out to Iowa CCI, Socially Responsible Agricultural Project, SREP, or JFAN for support. And I add JFAN in there because we just got a grant for me to start working more extensively in the state, shifting over the work I used to do with SREP until this past October when my contract concluded. And the organizing doesn't have to just expand a center around new or expanding CAFOs either. It really shouldn't. Jefferson County has a fraction of the number of hogs in our neighboring Washington and Keokuk counties because JFIN continually works to maintain a strong public presence in the county with many programs and projects. And as a result, we have a large and knowledgeable empowered group of supporters that really push back against CAFOs. Because communities that maintain a presence fare better than those that don't, JFAN developed and offers a training program to help communities create an organization like ours. And I've trained a number of groups over the past several years. So if you're interested, contact me at JFAN at LISCO, L-I-S-C-O dot com for more information. Second, and very importantly, 
we need to work on the state level and advocate for a factory farm moratorium and for better laws and regulations. If you're part of a community group, join it with the Iowa Alliance for Responsible Agriculture, IRA. Our coalition has about 30 members that work together to educate Iowans and lobby legislators on the need for a factory farm moratorium. There's strength in numbers and the more organizations that become members, especially community organizations, the greater influence we have. In fact, it's because of IRA's reaching out to Senator David Johnson back in 2017 that we even have a moratorium bill. And I really wanna thank him for getting the ball rolling on that one. Because of IRA's efforts, legislative co-sponsorship has also been growing every year. Also get connected with state groups like Iowa CCI, Iowa Sierra Club, Iowa Farmers Union, national organizations like Food and Water Watch and any of other, the other IRA or community organizations. If you don't know exactly what to do, because it can be overwhelming, it's like, where do I start with all of this? Um, this is an excellent way to get plugged in. When you get on the mailing lists of these organizations, including JFANS and IRAs, you'll get action alerts on important legislation, actions, or events that you can participate in. On a personal level, talk to friends and family members about this issue. Write letters to the editor, attend events and lobby days organized by IRA members, and call and write to your legislators, urging them to support the next moratorium bill. The more we each get involved and organized, the stronger our movement becomes to eventually get a moratorium enacted. And ultimately, that's the first step. Ultimately, it will pave the way to revert agriculture back to an environmentally nourishing practice. We are making progress and we all have the power to drive this change. And as we keep it up, we will ultimately prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank, thank you so much for your contributions to this movement and for sharing uh, those ways to engage. Um, and I wanna thank all of you all here in the room today for joining us tonight. Um, uh, you know, uh, as we've heard, there's been a, a we've we've done a brief overview, but there's always more to know about you know factory farming in Iowa, uh, its history and the struggle against it. There are so many resources in the back of the room. Uh, you know, research on uh, with with Brad over in the corner, uh, county by county. We have a number of Food and Water Watch and IRA fact sheets. And if you want to get involved, I strongly encourage you to speak to. Uh, any of the 100 Grannies volunteers in the uh, lime green shirts, uh, or me, uh, or you can even uh, you know find your name on the sign-in sheet, uh, and if you haven't signed in, sign in, but find your name and check the I Want a Volunteer box, and we can talk to you, talk to you all later. Um, we also, of course, have yard signs, and last but not least, food and camaraderie, so feel free to stick around, and thanks again for joining us tonight for this roadshow. show.